chapters on Muslim Christian encounters, Arabic speaking Christian theologians, and the Christian response to Muslim questions about the Holy Trinity. So uh, quite a wide variety of topics within this field. She is a member of the US Bishops Catholic Muslim Dialogue Group and previously served as a consultant on the Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with Muslims. Uh, so we're very excited to have Dr. Keating here with us tonight. Welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people came out for this uh, very, um, I think, uh, timely, um, interesting, complex, uh, controversial topic. And so um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, and I realized I had 40 minutes, uh, which is not nearly enough. Uh, this is at least an entire course, if not an entire, uh, entire series of courses of what I wanted to do tonight, um, I decided that I would uh, maybe try to give you a little bit of the lay of the land of this question. I'm not so interested tonight in, um, in, in coming up with a solution. Many uh, great minds are working on this problem right now and have been for quite some time. I hope that by the time I'm finished, you'll see that this is a, actually a question that has been with us since the very beginning of Islam. Um, this is not a new question, and many of the, um, the answers that I'm going to suggest to you tonight um, were proposed very early on uh, in the first encounters of Christians with Muslims. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about uh, where we are today, because of course, even though these are ancient questions and they are uh, questions that are very difficult, uh, we also have a new context in which we're asking them. And that new context is uh, an age in which we are living with constant 24-hour um, news cycle. Um, uh, you know, I can text uh, my friend in Jordan and ask what's going on, and I can get an answer almost immediately. Um, I can be in constant contact with people around the world. And I also get a lot of my news uh, filtered through, almost all of my news, uh, filtered through um, news outlets that may or may not know what they're talking about. And um, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is highly problematic for us. So uh, one of the things I want to uh, talk a little bit about tonight is kind of really um, where are we in this question today. So um, the first thing I want to start out with, I, I kind of in the title implied uh, what we've learned from 50 years of dialogue with Muslims, that, um, that one of the things that's changed has been the establishment of dialogues, of really um, uh, very intentional dialogues between Roman Catholics and Muslims since the Second Vatican Council. And that is something that, that has been different. Um, one of the parts of my research that I, when I first started out, uh, I've told the story to a lot of people uh, that I know here already know this, but when I first began studying Islam, um, 1987, 88, um, Everybody I told that I was going to be studying Islam said to me, well, where are you going to get a job? Because, of course, at that time, um, the trend was all Buddhism and Hinduism. And everyone I knew was studying Hinduism and Buddhism. I was the only person I knew who was studying Islam. Um, I ended up having to go to Europe to uh, study. Um, uh, I was at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islam to study Arabic. Um, I couldn't really find a place nearby where I could really study theology related to Islam. And then I defended my dissertation uh, in the spring of 2001. And on the day of 9-11, I was, the night before, I was headed to a conference in, um, in England to give a paper on my dissertation topic. And I was laying awake at night thinking, what am I gonna do when I get back? Because I'm gonna have to start looking for a job. And, um, and of course, uh, with 9-11, everything changed. What happened with 9-11 was that suddenly people in the United States, and perhaps in Europe to a certain extent, uh, became very aware that they knew almost nothing about Islam. And much of what they thought they knew probably wasn't exactly right. 
Uh, some people were aware, for example, of the Iranian Revolution and some of the, uh, the, the things that had happened with the uh, Shia Revolution there. Um, some people had traded in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, uh, other places. Um, but generally, the reason why I ended up in Europe studying Islam was because in the United States, almost all of our universities put Islam under the heading of history or political science. If you wanted to study Islam, you had to study, you had to take courses in political science or in the history department. And what that meant was that we had a very limited view of what Islam was about. Now this was not always the case. Um, uh, of course, this is the story of the United States and again, to a certain extent, Europe. But in fact, one of, the, um, one of the things that I think that has changed in the last 50 years for the Latin church is that we have become much, much more aware of the engagement between Muslims and Christians in the Greek-speaking uh, and the Arabic-speaking churches. Um, those are just two of them, Armenian, uh, Georgian, uh, Syriac-speaking churches, um, who from the very beginning were aware of, of Islam and asked many very serious questions, particularly about what is the relationship between what Muslims think, who are Muslims, and Christians. And that, I think, should um, help to guide us a little bit in our thinking about Islam today. Not to do completely determine it, but to recognize that very early on, people who watched uh, Islam uh, appear and got to know Muslims, worked side by side with Muslims, uh, participated in the society that Muslims began to build, um, that they watched very carefully and asked very serious questions about what does it mean to say that we share or do not share common beliefs. Today, um, one of the things that many of you may have heard is that uh, in Malaysia, there's been an ongoing controversy about whether or not Christians can use the name Allah in their, um, in their liturgy and in their language, I mean, in everyday language, which is actually a very strange development because um, the term Allah was actually used by Arabic-speaking Christians before the rise of Islam. Uh, it's very closely related to the Syriac term for, uh, for, for God, and it simply means God. But there is, or the God, it's, um, it's, there is in recent times more and more, I think, a polarization between Muslims and Christians in many, uh, in many groups, and that that has um, exacerbated in some ways some of the differences. So I want to say a little bit about that. But there is a way in which Christians um, have always shared this term, Allah, and that should mean something to us. We have um, always used Allah in the liturgy. We have used it in translations, biblical texts, et cetera, et cetera. But only recently has there been an attempt to try to limit the term to a Quranic or a particularly Muslim context. I think that that, um, that tells us something about the uh, world in which, we, in which we live. The very earliest, if you'll allow me to do a little bit of historical um, stuff here, uh, the very earliest Christians who encountered Muslims thought that Muslim, or that um, Islamic beliefs and practices probably reflected a kind of a, a diverse, maybe heretical sect of Christianity, or perhaps Judaism. Uh, probably the one that most of you would be the most familiar with is John of Damascus, although he was not the first to say this. Uh, this idea already appears within about 30 or 40 years after uh, Muhammad's death, that Christians recognized right away that there was quite a bit in common with Christian beliefs and with Jewish beliefs, but there were some profound differences. The most profound differences, to kind of cut to the chase, is that, um, uh, is that the Quran clearly rejects the concept of the Trinity and clearly rejects the idea of an incarnation. 
seems to reject the idea of original sin, which then calls into question um, the, uh, the idea of salvation history. Now, those are kind of the big three okay, for, for Christians, okay? Uh, and so what do we do with that? Um, if, it, on the one hand, we have all of this kind of common heritage, if you open up the Quran, practically any page, um, Christians and Jews will recognize the characters, the concepts, the commands, uh, many of the practices, and yet these very, very important central uh, theological teachings are not only missing from the Quran, but are in fact uh, rejected quite explicitly. John of Damascus took an approach, uh, like as I said, he wasn't the first to come up with it, but he makes it very explicit. Uh, he, sa he, he says Islam should be understood as a heresy. All right. And today in the modern world, we get very nervous when we hear the word heresy. I think we see it through the lens of um, probably the Protestant Reformation and all of the baggage that comes with that. For John, uh, as people at, at, um, in his period, they thought of heresy as uh, both as a way of giving kind of historical accounts, but also as a genealogy of errors, okay? That we could look at certain um, errors and mistakes, um, theological mistakes, for example, and say, okay, we can trace it back to this origin and perhaps even further so that all heresies can go back to Manichaeanism or can go back to, to uh, something that we can identify. And we can see how an original bad idea then kind of uh, explodes and spreads out into, um, into the rest of, the, of um, this, this sect or the group. John is actually quite critical of Islam. He uh, repeats many of the ideas that we find around that time, um, saying that uh, Muhammad was probably a kind of a charlatan. Um, he points out some inconsistencies in the, in the surahs. And I think a lot of times we focus very much on that. But for our purposes today, what I would like to focus on is that he thought it was a heresy. Okay. He didn't think that it was paganism that it was a philosophy, that it was something that was completely separated from Christianity. But rather, he understood that Muslims, and Islam, has, a, um, has something in common with Christians. Now, our question is, well, what does it have in common and what significance does that have? The difficulty um, that that, uh, that John was aware of was that there were lots and lots of sects. He saw Islam as a, a particularly important, and at his time, it was becoming a particularly influential um, sect. But John, in 750, was not aware of what the world would look like um, in a thousand years, for example, that Islam would, would, uh, would spread um, throughout uh, most of the known world by that time. What John was interested in, um, in pointing out was, and I think, um, uh, I'm not alone in this, but I think, John, I think we have to see all of John of Damascus' work from the perspective of the world in which he lived, which was a world in, w in which there was a serious challenge to religious practices of Christians, the Trinity, the Incarnation, he writes De Fide Orthodoxa, okay, I think in part to give a systematic and a clear explanation of the Christian faith in order to be able to respond to this challenge that he sees as a kind of a threat to Christianity. And at that point, he's pretty confident. I think uh, one of the reasons why we can, um, why we can make that argument is the emphasis or the, the, uh, the text that he put the um, writes on iconoclasm, all right, um, in defense of icons. This was a real a big um, uh, argument that went on between Muslims and Christians. Um, in general, Islam uh, prohibited images, and, in, and especially um, during the expansion of uh, the um, army, the Arab armies, there was a lot of destruction of images that went on. and. Many Christians began to question, along with their Jewish confreres, um, should we even allow images? 
Should we even allow images? It seems like there is a problem with the possibility of idolatry or um, somehow that uh, veneration of icons of saints can lead to a kind of polytheism, a kind of a creeping polytheism. And people like John made a very strong argument that it was absolutely necessary for Christians to defend veneration of icons because of the incarnation. That just as God can enter into creation and can uh, sanctify the material world, so to speak, and be present, that that allows us then to venerate this image of the image of God. As Christ is the image of God, uh, we can venerate the image of God. And he has a rather complex, he and uh, several others have a very common, Theodore Abukura, who is actually um, an Arabic, uh, a Greek and Arabic writer after him, has many treatises on, uh, on the veneration of icons. They saw this as an absolutely central um, practice that had to be defended by Christians. But they were very aware that the argument was not with people who didn't share anything, but rather people who did share something. The arguments that were being made from the Muslim side were actually making a, a, def a defense of the importance of venerating only one God and nothing that could lead to um, a, uh, a deviation from that could be allowed. Right? These early reactions to Muhammad um, also reflect concerns from people like John uh, that perhaps Muhammad had been influenced by other heretical groups. And this is an idea that finds its way um, into most of the literature of the period and ultimately into uh, the Latin speaking church's uh, reflections on, on Islam that, that Muhammad got most of his ideas, the theory was, that Muhammad got most of his ideas from a heretical sect. The ones that were most commonly uh, put out there, one most common at, at um, John of Damascus's time uh, was Nestorianism. There was a, um, a story that a monk, a, a um, Nestorian monk named Bahira, had in fact taught Muhammad all of these things. That's why there was so much commonality between the Quran and many of these teachings um, that Christians were already aware of. And that, so there was a way in which Muhammad had just been misled. All right, that was one of the ideas that, that was kind of floating around out there. What I want us to think about is that very early on, Islam and, uh, was never challenged as having something, you know, in, in, whether it had anything in common with Christianity. It wasn't necessarily treated from the Christian side as another religion, but certainly it was treated as a, a way of belief that although it had deviated from the orthodox faith, as uh, John would say, um, still maintained some very important and very significant commonalities. Now, this question that we have today, then, um, is extremely complex. And one of the reasons I wanted to give you a little bit of background there was to show that uh, people have been thinking about this for a very long time. They, um, it is not the case that all of a sudden, that in spite of the fact that um, all of us, oops, oh, oh, sorry about that, just a minute, that all of a sudden um, we woke up one day and realized that there was another religion out there, um, there is probably, it's, that may be the case for many people in the West, but it certainly wasn't the case for people in the East. All right, they were very aware of this for a long time. And I would say, again, one of the things that we've learned in 50 years is that we've become much, much more aware of the questions and answers and the engagement that has gone on between Muslims and Christians historically, apart from uh, Europeans. Now, how do we think about this problem? On the one hand, we can ask the question of who might a Catholic say, or what, that Muslims are worshiping. When we ask the question of, is God the Father, or is 
it the same God who is being worshipped. We have two kind of opposite positions that one might take that we've uh, that some theologians have developed. One is the first one is to say that there is only one God, and so to the extent that people are worshiping God, it's not as if they're worshiping a different God. There's only one God out there. Muslims have made the claim to worship this one God. And not only do Muslims claim to worship this one God, the Quran especially makes it very clear that Muslims understand that the God that they are worshiping is the God of Abraham, of Moses, of Jesus. And that's important. The Catholic Church also recognizes that Muslims desire to worship the one God authentically. That much of the engagement that went on between Muslims and Christians in the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century was focused on how does one identify uh, what we'll call the true religion. All right? um, and we have many treatises that go back and forth between Muslim and Christian intellectuals uh, saying how do you know when you have discovered or have come upon or heard of the true religion. And once you have discovered that, what are you obligated to do? All right. So they lay out a number of different criteria. Uh, one of the criteria that comes up all the time is whether it's necessary for a true religion to have miracles. And um, if one has miracles, then that is an indication of that God is favoring or has confirmed that religion. A difficulty that Muslims ran into with this is that Muhammad never claimed, in the beginning, did not claim miracles for himself. Uh, in fact, uh, in the very early stages, uh, or the early period of Islam, it seems to be the case that, um, that the claim was that the only real miracle is the miracle of the Quran the revelation to uh, Muhammad was the miracle itself. Because Muhammad was not seen or as a, um, he's not the founder of Islam. He is simply the prophet through whom the revelation comes. So this question of, is it necessary for Muhammad himself to have been able to um, perform miracles apart from revealing the, the revelation of the Quran and receiving the Quran. Uh, is there another criteria? Okay. Other people argued a uh, moral code, um, uh, that it has to be ancient, it has to have a, an authenticated genealogy, um, that it has to work towards peace, that it has to, um, uh, let's see, um, yeah, those are the main ones, okay. Um, that uh, it, it has to be accessible both to the, um, the, uh, the intelligent and the not so intelligent, okay. Uh, it, so it has to be able to be recognized as uh, rationally coherent by the intelligent and the educated, um, and it has to speak to and draw those who are um, less educated into it. So we find then, uh, on the one hand, we have this, this affirmation that there is only one God, and the problem is trying to figure out how we can authentically worship that God. And as I said, Muslim Christians, and even, uh, and, and at certain periods, we find also Jews kind of jumping into the argument. So we have people like Maimonides who also make contributions to these questions. Um, and they're, they're, they understand that the conversation that they're having is one that could be productive. They don't seem to think that, that um, they're going to come up with a definitive answer, or they're going to come up with the answer that will cause, for example, all the Muslims to convert to, uh, to Christianity or all the Christians to convert to Islam. That doesn't seem to be the goal most of the time. Most of the time is trying to come to an understanding of how one knows that one is authentically worshiping God. A second problem, though, which I'm sure most of you have thought of already, is that if one holds that um, an attribute or an action of God um, has a very different understanding of that attribute or action of God. 
can one say that it is really belief in the same God? Or what if it is only a slightly different understanding, but not incompatible? How much is enough? How much is too little? So I'll give an example of that. Um, the question of um, mercy, okay, that God is merciful. Muslims say that uh, in, uh, in pr uh, constantly in prayer, uh, God, the beneficent God, the merciful. And mercy is an absolutely central uh, concept in Christianity. Is it the same? Do we understand mercy to be the same thing? We can, on the one hand, say that we have a general concept of what merciful means. But on the other hand, we might say that um, the Christian understanding of mercy is very closely tied to God's mercy as revealed in the incarnation. And that God's mercy um, to us as children of God, or children, uh, um, that that is different from the way Muslims might understand mercy to servants of God. This has been a topic, again, that has been debated a great deal. Another question um, that was very uh, of great interest to me when I, I actually wrote my dissertation and I've written a couple of articles on this problem. For Christians, the unity and oneness of God is a trinity. For Muslims, this cannot be the case. So how can we speak of this unity of God in the same way? Do we really, do we really mean the same thing or not? One route that people have gone, and an important figure in this, uh, Cardinal de, Lu de Luogo, who died in the year 1660, uh, um, wrote a fair amount about this, and one of the points that he brings up is that he, he wants to talk about revel, revelation, of whether we can think of Muslims, or in what way we can think of Islam as having received some kind of revelation. Is that revelation in the Quran? Is it a just natural revelation? Is it something more specific than that? And he raises a very interesting problem, which is that he says, Muslims have faith in Abraham, not just because of nat a natural discovery of Abraham, but precisely because their sacred texts are reliant, and this is the key, they're reliant on the Old and New Testament, even if they are, uh, if they are reliant in an erroneous way. He is um, using an idea that uh, the phrase has kind of been coined more in the modern period of dependency, that the Quran is in some way dependent on the Old and New Testament. If one argues that the Quran is dependent on the Old and New Testament, then one makes uh, the, the next step is that then there must be aspects or parts of um, somehow seeds of the word or elements of truth as the Second Vatican Council puts it, within the Quran itself. And that somehow that might reflect the activity of the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean that the Quran itself, and, and De Luogo would say no, that the Quran itself is revelation, but the idea of dependency shows that there is some continuity. A very important um, theme that comes up, uh, and it's, um, I've participated in a couple of dialogues that this has been the, uh, the central topic, is the question of Mary. Mary um, is held in very high esteem in Islam. She is the only woman uh, named by name in the Quran. She has an entire surah of her own in the Quran. And many of the stories that we find in the Quran are from the um, extra canonical writings, the apocryphal writings. Um, there are great many details about Mary uh, in the Quran that are not found in the Bible, in the New Testament. Uh, 
Mary is recognized, for example, um, as having um, received God's word. Um, Jesus, of course, in the Quran, is understood to um, have been cast into Mary as God's word, so a kind of virginal conception. Um, she, is, uh, she is recognized as having been protected um, from sin. Um, she functions in a very special role. And this is not something that one would come to, Duolingo <laughs> would say. Um, he would say that um, this is not something that one comes to through rational deduction. All right? So it must in some way be reminiscent of revelation, at least. When we get to the modern period, we have a lot of questions of how to articulate this in, uh, in a way that is both accurate and open, but restrictive enough to be consistent with um, theological you know, uh, commitments that have gone before. What that means is we don't want to say too much and we don't want to say too little. One of the first times that we see a really a, 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 um, an actual cons a document um, that mentions Muslims by name is in Second Vatican Council. But it, the Nostra Aetate, which is what most people are, are familiar with, that speaks specifically about Muslims, um, it didn't occur in a vacuum. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes here talking about um, some of the other documents that can help us to understand what uh, the, the conclusions that were reached in uh, the Second Vatican Council. So I have a few church documents here that I think we can go through fairly quickly um, that give us a little bit of an insight. And all of these are drawing on previous texts. Right? Um, most of these we can find parallels either in uh, the Arabic texts, in, uh, in Latin texts from the medieval period. Um, but here we see, in Lumen Gentium 16, the plan of salvation includes those who acknowledge the creator. And of course, this means in the first place amongst these, there are the Muslims, who professing to hold the faith of Abraham along with us adore the one and merciful God. So here we have the, the one and merciful God, nobiscum deum adorant unicum misericordium who in the last day will judge mankind. Okay, so that's a second, it's a third aspect. We have the idea of the um, God as creator, uh, the um, God as merciful, God as last judge. Through her work, and this is an, uh, a little bit further on, through her work, whatever good is in the minds and hearts of men, Whatever good lies latent in the religious practices and cultures of diverse peoples is not only saved from destruction, but is also cleansed, raised up, and perfected unto the glory of God, the confusion of the devil, and the happiness of man. So in Lumen Gentium, we see kind of a recognition that there are some parallels, and that these parallels then can be identified and perfected, raised up, uh, unto the glory of God. This is something that we find very early on, again. Um, already in the, um, say the eighth, ninth century, we see Christians writing uh, in response to Islam, trying to, and, and to Muslims, trying to identify, for example, ways that, um, that we can speak about Christian doctrines such as the incarnation by pointing to exactly the idea that God cast the word into Mary and this is Jesus. Many uh, Christian writers take that and, and really try to develop that and say, well, that's exactly what Christians are speaking of when we speak of the incarnation. That there are ways to um, identify what is in the Quran as, as we'll see, seeds of the word. Another one by Paul VI um, 
it, it came out during the council, uh, Ecclesiam Suam, he also mentions uh, in, uh, in a, spe a particularly interesting way a couple of times uh, Islam. Then we have those worshipers who adhere to other monotheistic systems of religion, especially the Muslim religion. We do well to admire these people for all that is good and true in their worship of God. Not identifying specifically what is good and true, they leave that up to us, which is what is the difficult part, um, but saying that there is something that is good and true in their worship, and that I have kind of a recognition um, that this is God, that the one God. Nostra Aetate, of course, is the most explicit of all these. This is the document on the um, uh, on the other religions, and chapter three devoted specifically to Islam. I did not um, add here, there's also a section in here about um, overcoming the past, that's a whole other lecture, you have to invite me another time for that if you want to know about that. Um, I just want to talk more specifically here about, um, about this unity and uh, adoration of the one God. The church regards with esteem also the Muslims. They adore the one God, Qui unicum deum adorant, so unicum deum, uh, living and subsisting in himself, merciful and all powerful, the creator of heaven and earth, who has spoken to men. They take pains to submit wholeheartedly even to even his inscrutable decrees, just as Abraham, with whom the faith of Islam takes pleasure in linking itself, submitted to God. Though they do not acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as prophet. They also honor Mary, his virgin mother. At times, they even call on her with devotion. In addition, they await the day of judgment when God will render their deserts to all those who have been raised up from the dead. Finally, they value the moral life and worship God, especially through prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. So here again, we see this uh, desire to identify some of those things that Muslims and Christians may have in common without going in too deeply um, about what, um, how they fit into the larger context. So for example, we can ask the question of, of prayer. Um, Muslims uh, uh, have uh, prayer five times a day, which is absolutely central uh, to um, uh, their um, uh, religion. Um, and we ask the question of, um, well, what is that, I mean, in what way is that prayer similar or different to what Christians are doing? There is a devotion to prayer. There's a devotion to fasting. Uh, is the fasting the same, okay? Could it lead to the same thing? Nostra Aetate was both um, widely accepted at the time that it came out as being a move in the right direction because it tried to move the conversation, at least in the West, uh, towards a more positive way of thinking about Muslims and about Islam, okay, and to overcome some of the misconceptions that, um, that had been, uh, it had developed um, since the Middle Ages in, in the Latin church. On the other hand, there was also a concern that perhaps it said too little. Muslims, for example, were quite critical of the text because it doesn't mention Muhammad or the Quran. Okay. Um, but the desire here, I think, was to identify what might be fruitful topics of conversation. I can say that in interreligious dialogue, one of the um, things that we have tried to do is to take up some of these topics. Uh, most recently, um, several of the dialogues that I've worked with are, have taken up the question of Abraham. And I'll say just a little bit about that in a minute. Um, as uh, in what way do we identify Abraham as a common uh, figure? Uh, what, way, what, what do we hold in common in our thinking about Abraham? And in what way is it different? The last one before I go on, I just want to point out, um, uh, there is a text, uh, Pope St. Gregory VII's letter. Um, this was kind of in the background of Nostra Aetate. Not many people are aware of it, but if you look at the footnotes, you'll see I thought it might be useful to put this out there, that this was a, a, a previous papal document from 1076 in which he had written the, um, a letter to this uh, Muslim king of Mauritania. And um, it's actually quite an interesting letter. Um, but this very significant sentence in here, 
We and you, Gregory's writing to the Muslims, must show in a special way to the other nations an example of this charity. For we believe and confess one God, although in different ways, and praise and worship him daily as the creator of all ages and the ruler of this world. So again, um, uh, we can ask ourselves the question of, you know, in what, well, what does it mean in different ways? Uh, in what way do we praise and worship? But there is a basic recognition that the, um, that, that the desire is to worship the one creator and ruler of the world. So what does this mean for us? Um, I want to just point out, uh, just in the last few minutes here, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions, so I don't want to go on too long here. Um, what does this mean for us today as we think about this problem? On the one hand, I would say interreligious dialogue has made a tremendous, uh, in the last 50 years, we've made tremendous progress in coming to understand better what each of us um, believes. This question of, well, how do we regard Abraham? For Christians and Jews, Abraham is, um, uh, what's significant about Abraham is the covenant with Abraham. For Muslims, the covenant plays a much uh, smaller role, and, and for many Muslims, it plays almost no role. What's important is Abraham as a prophet, as someone who has received a revelation. Um, that seems to be significant. For Christians, the covenant of Abraham is a significant moment in salvation history that as God is established and continues to maintain this relationship with human beings, the covenant with Abraham, which according to the Jewish scriptures goes through his son Isaac, that Isaac um, is, fulfills this promise in a particular way. Muslims have said, well, um, that's less important and generally Muslims will claim their genealogy through Ishmael, the other son. Does that make a difference? For Jews and Christians, I think it does. Um, I've been very cautious about using the, the um, term uh, Abrahamic religions, although it does uh, help us in some ways. It helps us actually to be able to identify that Muslims, Jews, and Christians have something in common that we do not have in common with Buddhists, for example. A difficulty with it, though, is that um, Muslims, Jews, and Christians uh, have a very different idea of how, of who Abraham is and how Abraham functions in the religion. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in um, the Mid-Atlantic Dialogue met and um, in Massachusetts, and we had a very interesting conversation about Moses. And interestingly, um, Moses as lawgiver. Uh, did not come up on the Muslim side. Not that, um, not that Moses is not uh, in any way a lawgiver, but Moses is understood primarily as a prophet again. And there are many aspects of the story of Moses that we see in the Quran that do not appear in the Jewish scriptures. Some of these, uh, some of these um, stories change the way we might think about who Moses is. This is, an, this is an important step forward, I think, to have Muslims and Christians t uh, sitting together, looking at the scriptures, going through it, saying, well, does this change the story? Is this important? Um, it has helped, I think, Catholics to uh, um, affirm uh, many uh, ideas that we have about uh, the important aspects of theological questions. Uh, a few years ago, I guess it's getting to be more than a few years ago now, the, Mid uh, the Midwest Dialogue published a document which I st strongly recommend that you look at if you are interested in this topic, on Revelation. Um, I think that it's probably one of the clearest, briefest uh, explanations of the differences of the way that Catholics and Muslims think about Revelation. We both believe that God communicates to us, 
uh, that God has a uh, desires to have a relationship with human beings. That it's we can there are certain aspects of certain kinds of knowledge that we can only receive through revelation. That revelation has a special status in our religions. And yet, the way that that revelation occurs is understood to be very different. For Christians, revelation comes primarily through the person of Jesus Christ. For Muslims, revelation comes through a book or a, um, that has, is sent down. And by book, I don't mean an actual book. I mean a kind of a scripture, maybe is a better word of, of saying it, that is given to prophets uh, at various times throughout history as a way of reminding people of God's commands and what God expects. This is uh, this difference, actually, this document, um, was one of the reasons why a lot of people began moving away from using the term people of the book. Um, some of you who were, uh, may have been involved in interreligious dialogue uh, years ago, for a while, um, we use the term people of the book to uh, signify Muslims, Christians, and Jews. But after working on this document on Revelation, it became quite clear that uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews have a very different understanding of what it means to, to speak of a book. In fact, for Christians, the book is not nearly as important as, uh, as the person of Jesus Christ. I think that these are two ways, both in speaking about Abraham and speaking about the people of the book, that we can see kind of progress being made in, um, in our thinking of how we can both um, acknowledge the existence and uh, well, not ignore the existence, acknowledge the, yeah, the existence of commonalities, uh, common beliefs, perhaps, um, common desires, perhaps, is even more important of our desire to, uh, to worship the one God, but uh, that we can also see that we have significant differences. And these significant differences have very practical consequences in many ways. Um, another one that we, another document that we worked on, uh, the Bishop's Conference was the one on marriage. I highly recommend all of you um, seminarians and priests who might one day be called on to uh, um, help it prepare people uh, in an interreligious marriage. Uh, this document was, I think, is, is very helpful. It was written by both Muslims and Catholics uh, explaining what the expectations and the understanding of marriages in the two uh, in the two religions. Again, one of the conclusions we came to was that bo for both sides, uh, marriage is an extremely important um, institution. It's more than just a, a legal contract. Uh, it is um, it's absolutely necessary for the. Um, proper rearing of children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we also quickly came to the conclusion that we have some very different ideas about marriage. And uh, this document tries to lay that out as, uh, as well as we could come up with it. But we, we recognized right away that we have commonalities and differences. I want to um, kind of, let's see, oops. I want to uh, uh, talk about one last thing. It's a little bit more recent, but I think this is very, um, very useful. In 1982, Pope John Paul II gave an address uh, to Muslim leaders in uh, Nigeria. And the, the entire address is very interesting. I just put a few paragraphs up, up here um, on it. I think uh, that helps us to see kind of the direction that we've taken since Second Vatican Council. He says, all of us, Christians and Muslims, live under the sun of the one merciful God. And again, we identify this, this one merciful God as something we have in common. We both believe in one God who is the creator of man. We acclaim God's sovereignty and we defend man's dignity as God's servant. We adore God and profess total submission to him. Thus, in a true sense, we can call one another brothers and sisters in faith in the one God. And we are grateful for this faith, since without God, the life of man would be like the heavens without the sun. Because of this faith that we have in God, Christianity and Islam have many things in common. 
the privilege of prayer, the duty of justice accompanied by compassion and almsgiving, and above all, a sacred respect for the dignity of man, which is at the foundation of the basic rights of every human being, including the right to life of the unborn child. We Christians have received from Jesus, our Lord and Master, the fundamental law of love of God and love of neighbor. I know that this law of love has a profound echo in your hearts too, for in your sacred book, together with the invitation to the faith, you are exhorted to excel in good works. Um, I think that um, we've come to realize that uh, doing good works is not sufficient, um, although good works, doing good works together is a good start. Okay? If we would be able to do good works together, uh, that that would take us a long way. It's not enough. It's not the end of the story. Um, the theological dialogue has continued, probably will continue, uh, many of these very sticky problems, particularly the question about um, dependency, um, about uh, the historical genealogy of, uh, of Islam with, through Ishmael, is uh, one that is somewhat contentious. Um, the status for Muslims, the, the authenticity of the scriptures, of the Christian and Jewish scriptures, um, has been called into question by the Quran. The Quran um, makes reference to distortions that we find in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. And all of these continue to be topics that we can, I think, are going to have to uh, continue in the next few years to, um, to explore. But if there's one bit of progress that we might have made is to recognize that um, Christians and Muslims have, from the very beginning, recognized that we share something unique in common. Identifying exactly what that is and what we mean by that is a little more difficult. But I guess I would say, the short answer is, do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God? I think as Catholics, the answer has to be yes. The next question is, what does that mean? Um, that's, I, I think, not too controversial to say that. But for now, um, what we can say, and I think what we have a, a very good uh, tradition for, is that we believe in one God who is creator, that we seek to adore and worship that God, and that even though we don't agree on many aspects um, of that belief and worship, as Christians, um, we hold that God desires the salvation of all people, and that the Holy Spirit is at work in mysterious ways in every person. And so I'm going to conclude by simply saying then that I think that our call at this point in time is to continue in this task of faith-seeking understanding. 